This is Immuno Africa, a podcast dedicated to spotlighting African immunology research. The first edition of the Immunology in Africa podcast graduate student series seeks to spotlight the motivations, journeys, and perspectives of African graduate students in immunology while highlighting their amazing contributions to the field. It offers our listeners an opportunity to explore and keep tabs on the inspiring works of young African scientists in the early phases of their careers, especially those keen on strengthening the continent's capacity for scientific research, growth and development. For this first series, we spoke with six graduate students pulled from five African countries whose research spans a rich diversity of viral diseases, vaccine development, cancer, obesity, autoimmunity, and allergies. The stories told here portray self-motivation, initiative, resilience, hard work, excellence, consistency, growth, discipline, planning, and patience. These stories offer valuable insights and lessons to young and emerging scientists interested in building a career in immunology, as well as established scientists in the field. For the fifth episode on this series, I speak with Ubong Eperipe. Ubong is a PhD candidate in the Experimental Therapeutics and Pharmacology program at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, where he studies obesity and kidney diseases. He trained as a pharmacist at the University of Joss before earning a master's degree in pharmacology at the University of Benin, both in Nigeria. He has also served as a junior research fellow at the School of Pharmacy University of the Western Cape, South Africa. Ubong's current research is focused on understanding the role of macrophage inflammatory protein 3-alpha and various immune cells in the progression of kidney injuries in children with obesity. Findings from this research will not only enhance our understanding of how these immune cells contribute to the onset of kidney diseases, but also inform the design of appropriate therapies. Cooking is one of Ubong's most enjoyable things to do, and he has been honing his skills since he turned nine. My name is Ubong, and um, I'm from Nigeria. And so just a little about my academic background. I studied, or I'm originally a pharmacist, so I received my bachelor's degree in pharmacy from the University of Jos in Nigeria in 2013, after which I received a master's in pharmacology at the University of Benin at 2019 or in 2019. So between my bachelor's degree and my master's, I got involved in a whole lot of things. I mean, practicing as a pharmacist, I got involved in working as um, a drug information um, scientist or pharmacist. I don't know if you are familiar with the formula called MDEX. So I used to contribute to um, MDEX, the drug formulary, which most Nigerian doctors and pharmacists use. So um, MDEX is actually an acronym for Essential Medicines Index. Okay. Yes. So, um, you know, like different countries have what they call formularies. So the formulary essentially gives you a list of drugs that are approved for use in that country. Because like okay. sometimes a drug might be okay, but a, com- a country doesn't approve it for you. So basically it's based on the NAVDAC approved list of drugs for mm-hmm. the country, Nigeria. Yeah, so yeah. what we do is, you know, like the thing is drug information is really a huge thing, particularly when you're getting the primary drug information from the company, it's a whole lot. Doctors and um, nurses, health professionals, they have like split seconds to make decisions and they cannot be reading that whole thing to make a decision. Mm, so basically, yeah. what the formulary does is we basically get these primary sources of information and we write condensed monographs of these drugs. Okay. Basically stating what they are used for, the indications, the contraindications, the dosages, and even possible drug interactions, the advice to give the patient when taking it. So, okay. you know, a doctor or a pharmacist or a health professional could open that and within a few seconds, we'll just yeah, understand yeah. what the yeah, and you know, since it's not like these are lay people, they already know about these drugs, but that will just serve as reminders. And also in between the bachelor's degree and the master's, I also went to South Africa as a visiting junior researcher at the School of Pharmacy, University of the Western Cape. Yeah, so I learned, um, I began to learn skills in molecular docking, molecular dynamic simulations and homology modeling. So um, in 2019, I moved to the US 
to start a PhD in pharmacology, which is partly sponsored by the um by a predoctoral fellowship from the American Heart Association. Um, while I was in Nigeria, I when I was doing my masters, I was working on diabetes, basically a rat model okay. of diabetes. So yeah, at that point, I got so interested in metabolism, essentially like diabetes, obesity, and so while applying for PhDs, I guess um programs that had this core component of cardiovascular and metabolic diseases were really of interest to me. Of luckily, my program here is really strong in that area. So when I got here, there was a professor, um, Dr. Williams, who was working on diabetic kidney disease and um, kidney disease due to obesity and um, hypertension. So on getting here, he had a project on basically obesity-induced kidney disease, precisely childhood obesity. And um, so getting, I was actually still keen on like, oh, you know, I was so excited about metabolism, lipid metabolism, glucose metabolism. So I was basically selling some of these ideas to him like, oh yeah, we could do some stuff on lipid metabolism, glucose metabolism. And he was like, yeah, that's cool. But currently, the current grant is focused on looking at something else. And then he told me about it. Um, so essentially, I'll just give you three things we talked about. So he talked about something called macrophage inflammatory protein tree alpha. He talked about dendritic cells. Then he talked about T cells. And so I began to read a lot because I realized, oh, it was, we're talking about macrophages, immune system here. So mm -hmm. I had to start reading a lot about the immune system, especially the immune system, like how the immune system contributes to kidney diseases and generally chronic disorders like hypertension, diabetes, yeah. and obesity. And, you know, it was, it was so interesting that I discovered a whole lot and you know so some i guess i just i fell in love with the whole thing you know one thing that i kind of got really excited in is, you know when they begin to talk about this evolutionary basis of the immune system and how you know i'll just share a little with you one thing that excited me particularly in context of obesity you know as you become obese you have these lipid accumulations the immune system somehow is tied the, the activation of the immune system is tied to abnormal lipid metabolism sometimes because like they they use these lipids for activation so sometimes like when it's so much it makes them also undergo this inappropriate activation that was one very yes one very exciting thing i saw then and i think what really excited me the most was how i could link my metabolism like interest with the immune system so i was like oh well yeah this is where it is like it's good stuff yeah <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. Yeah, really, really interesting story. So, um, I, I think I just want to ask quickly, like maybe because yes, please. What was your background like uh, before? You know, your PhD because you like you know it was almost as if Devine terminology was somewhat new for you. So, did you have um, prior uh, background in immunology that was like sufficient sufficient foundation to build upon, or it was just like it was pretty much Devine something new to a large extent? Mm. Mm. Well, I would say maybe, I guess I was aware of immunology prior because like in pharmacy, we did this as part of our therapeutics. We had to study immunotherapies just at least at the basic level. So that was something. Then during my master's, we had a course that tried to talk a little about um, immunopharmacology, but it didn't really talk about the immune system. It was really talking more about inflammation, prostaglandins, bradykinins, like the histamines and the likes. So the whole, like, you know, the immune system, I was just aware of the immune system as something that helps to fight diseases like infections. You mm -hmm. understand? And that is where most people look at it. So, you know, coming here, it was, to tell you the truth, it was entirely new to me to hear that, oh, well, yeah, this immune system can contribute to hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, like it was, it was different. So in that area, it was it was entirely new. But I think luckily, since the department already had this strong foundation, studying it, like we, we have some professors who are big on studying the role of the immune system in preeclampsia, which is hypertension in pregnancy. So, you know, they, they already, typically when they are teaching us, like they have this strong, the component, the immunology component of the pharmacology course is strong. So like you would really begin to appreciate everything if you love it. So yeah. That was it, right? Yeah. So, so let's delve deeper into your your work here, your PhD work, and you know some of the. Of course, you've you've been on it for a couple of years since like twenty nineteen. So, like, what are some of the um findings you have made from you know your research and um the implications? Their implications. 
Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. So um, like essentially, my research focuses on, like I said, certain interactions between the immune system and, in this case, insulin resistance in obesity. But the insulin resistance still ties back to some kind of inflammatory state. So um, essentially, what I have been looking at over the years is to study how some of these changes, like maybe inflammatory changes, and even insulin resistance, can contribute to the development of this kidney disease in obesity. And precisely, like I said, we focus on childhood obesity. You know, since it's a basic science program, we cannot use human beings to do this work. So we need to have like our own in vivo model. Then we do some other ex vivo experiments. So we make use of a rat model. We make use of a rat model that has a leptin receptor mutation. And so, Essentially, that makes the rats get um, fat. Yeah, I'm giving this background so that we know what we are I'm talking about. Like it's like once they are born, within a, within a few weeks, you already begin to see them looking chubby. And from as early as that time, you begin to see this renal injury in them. So what we do is we begin to study. So now today, to how we got to this point, you know, we did some um, immunofluorescence, like immunohistochemistry, and we observed that okay, this macrophage inflammatory protein three alpha, which I talked about is um, increased in the kidneys of these of these rats when compared to like the, the ones that are lean. And we set out to say, okay, well, what can we really, so might it be playing a role in um, the renal injury we see? So we decided to administer neutralizing antibodies to these rats then to, to track their progress, okay. to track progress of this disease, yes. and. It was really amazing. We saw this remarkable reduction in renal injury just by measuring the renal injury parameters. We have lots of functional parameters and histological parameters we assess. We saw this massive, or should I say, like a two, threefold decrease in kidney disease. And, you know, since we are doing immunology, we had to like zero in on the um, immune mechanisms that might be involved. And so yeah. looking at these kidneys, when so just to give you a background, this macroinflammatory protein three alpha is a chemokine that's like it's a cytokine, but you know, the chemokines are cytokines that help. So typically in injury, an immune cell or generally just an injured cell in the body can secrete a chemokine. What the chemokine does is that it attracts other immune cells to come to the area because it may feel oh, maybe there's an infection here. Come and help us or come and help us repair this. So that this macroinflammatory protein three alpha recruits dendritic cells, it recruits T cells, it recruits B cells to sites of injury. So we were interested to see how the effect of neutralizing this anti um, neutralizing this macrophage inflammatory protein three alpha might be on the kidneys. And interestingly, we expectedly we saw a decrease in some of the dendritic cell populations. We saw a decrease in some of the T cell populations, and we saw a decrease in B cells. So I mean, it was like it showed that what we did was working yeah. at the immunological level and was translating to a functional outcome. So based on that, we knew that macrophage inflammatory protein 3 alpha was really relevant. So, you know, that was just looking at it at the experimental level. But, you know, now when you have these results, you want to make sense of the results. So I, we had to go back to the literature. Okay, what's really macrophage inflammatory protein 3 alpha? How does it contribute to kidney disease, obesity, diabetes? And to tell you the truth, when before I started the work, I was really checking and I could not find so much on it, even though luckily I found this paper that was published in Germany in 2010 at the time on glomerulonephritis, which is like, which is a kidney disease that has this autoimmune component. And the guys also saw that this um, macrophage inflammatory protein, I can just call it MIP3A from here. This MIP3A is increasing the kidneys, but in their own case, when they tried to block it, it worsened kidney disease. Mm. And some yeah, some other guys also saw that it wasn't kidney disease like in folate in folic acid induced kidney injury. So I was like, wow, are you sure this will work? And we were like, oh well, let's see. When we used it, it improved. So we realized that it may have been a context dependent event because um initially in certain like acute diseases, it may focus more on recruiting immune cells that help to repair. But in a chronic disease like obesity, it could um yeah. be doing that something that wasn't doing it. Okay. Exactly. exactly. So that's, that's, the, that's one fun thing about the immune system. I think you can't mm -hmm. predict. So looking through the literature, 
That was what we found. But with time, we now began to see that some people had done some work in diabetic kidney disease, and they had seen that it was increasing the kidneys in diabetes. Then one thing that also made me really excited was that we now found that even in the system of obese individuals, it's also increased. So, you know, that made us realize, oh, well, like, wow, this, like, even from a translational standpoint, beyond the basic science, from a translational standpoint, this is something that could be used. I mean, like, it could be used to improve metabolic states and kidney disease and other complications of obesity. So that's like one take-home message from there. Then from there, we set out, since we know quite well that, well, this is working, we decided to look at the cells. Now, we decided to look at the cells and we saw that typically macrophages, dendritic cells, T cells are also increasing the kidneys of these rats. So one of the things we wanted to see was like, you know, since dendritic cells and macrophages are antigen presenting cells, that is to say, these are the cells that they could pick bad stuff in the body and present it to T cells and ask the T cells to do the adaptive immunity part of the work. And yes, so we're like, okay, if we do something to stop T cell activation, might that also, that's so now we are no longer working at the chemokine level. We're looking at how do we just do something that interferes with this immune cell signal yeah. and we're like okay fine exactly we're like fine okay let's see whether we could block it and then there is this drug called abatacept abatacept is primarily is developed or was developed for rheumatoid arthritis but you know interestingly over the past maybe 10 or 15 years people have been doing this beautiful work with abatacept and they are seeing its impact on chronic diseases like i think in 2000 11 or 12 some guys had already done some work in this kidney disease that affects children and adults and they could see these good improvements when they gave a better set okay and then um, yes then also even in hypertension in pregnancy some other people had done some work here in mississippi and they saw improvements recently i also discovered that there is a group in vanderbilt that is um, in vanderbilt university that even has these um, grants to administer it to hypertensive patients. So like, mm -hmm. like they are already taking it, they are trialing it at this mm -hmm. point. So it's really interesting. So you know, when we treated these rats with abatacept and did the whole functional and immunological analysis, we saw improvements in kidney disease as well. So it was, it was really impressive. And you know, typically what we basically do to track kidney disease program is to measure the proteins. So we were, when measuring the proteins, then measuring some other molecular markers, we could see this improvement. And then looking at the immunology of the whole thing, it did decrease the T cells, it decreased the macrophages and some of the some of the dendritic cell population. So you know we were able to tie everything together. Like, oh wow, there are this this immune system is actually playing an important role in kidney disease in this model. In, at a very young age. And you know, one thing just to say a little bit about the, the insulin resistant aspect of the work. So, you know, one thing we kept observing because since we are studying metabolic disease, we don't just focus on the kidneys, we try to measure some metabolic parameters. And so whenever we administer some of these um, anti-inflammatory stuff to the rats, we do see improvements in metabolic parameters like insulin resistance improves dyslipidemia improves. And you know, since we give this thing systemically, we're like, okay, well, that might be something. And obviously there is a link between inflammation and insulin resistance in obesity. So we're like, okay, fine, let us now see if we just decide to directly target insulin resistance, will there be improvements in even the, the inflammatory states of these rats? And so we used metformin to improve insulin sensitivity. And we did see improvements in kidney disease, but I think what we didn't really expect that at least we saw to our next end was that we also observed these improvements in inflammatory states, like some of like just some of the macrophage populations. You could see a decrease. Some of the other cells were not affected, but that was really beautiful. And you know, we had to now ask ourselves, okay, it means the injury in the kidneys might be occurring not just as a result of systemic changes, but some maybe specific things happening in the kidneys. And then, you know, typically like the glomerulus helps to filter the blood. It uses this pressure to do it. But when the pressure becomes too much, it damages the kidneys. So what we now realized was that, okay, this insulin resistance seems to be contributing to some changes that increased the filtration pressure 
in the kidneys. And when the kidneys get damaged, those kidneys secrete macrophage inflammatory protein 3 alpha, which is the chemokine that we started working on from the beginning. Okay. And yes, that local secretion in the kidney might be contributing to the recruitment of these immune cells. Immune cells. Okay. So like that was yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so that was really it was really, really interesting. We're able to tie everything together, like saying, okay, insulin resistance could be damaging these kidneys. And then when the kidneys are damaged, they secrete or um, it beginning to it makes it to injure these kidneys, not damage. And when these kidney cells are injured, they secrete this um chemokine MIP3A that recruits all these cells, and then it causes this inflammation that just makes the disease to progress very fast. And you know, to just tie everything together, we think this is important because number one, insulin resistance states are very common in children, and these drugs are already approved, like metformin. So people are already using these things in children. So being able to use it in this case would not be so difficult. And then for the MIP 3 a and the abatacept, like, you know, I'm happy because even though this would not have immediate use in the clinic, people are still doing trials across various segments of kidney disease. So I think in the future, these are things that hold potential because believe me, people are really working on how the immune system contributes to chronic kidney disease and other cardiovascular metabolic disease. So in the future, don't be surprised if people begin to give these drugs targeting the immune system for conditions like what we have already mentioned. Mm. Thank you. I, I think that's that's a lot to take in. So I'm just going to um, provide, kind of give a brief summary to be sure that we're on the same yeah. page. Yeah, so basically, um, um, I think from, um, okay, so let, let me put it this way. So part of what you are saying is, okay, the um, insulin, resistance related to uh, metabolic disorders, like uh, when the body is not able to uh, kind of process, balance that process, processing of how much food it's taking in and how much food it's using can contribute to damages in the kidney. And that when the kidney is damaged, the kidney can produce or secrete rather kind of a kind of way of produce, producing a, a protein that can bring other immune cells and lead to damage. In the kidney, so that protein is the um, MIP three that you've been trying to target, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes. So yes. That, the, that, yeah, that's a good summary. Yes. Okay. So the the drug. So like I just. The right one. Yeah. So the drug you said the the okay. So at, at the point you said you were actually targeting the protein, like the protein that the chemical can be secreted. And then you also yes. found that another drug could help you, you know, target a latter stage in the process to so preventing the T cells from mm -hmm. being activated because the cells, the secretion between T cells and then T cells will also cause their own damage. Mm -hmm. So, okay. okay. That's, yes. that's, I think it's really uh, a fascinating um, study. And um, uh, considering the fact that uh, I, I think there have been this um, conversation around um, obesity and, you know, uh, metabolic diseases and especially in young young children. I think I saw um maybe a publication on one of these news outlets that even you no, know, I think the initial convention was that okay, high income countries were really the ones that should be bothered about obesity in children. But I think I saw something maybe sometime last year, last year, that even low income countries, <laughs> which wouldn't be more bothered, like the rate of obesity, especially in young people, children, is really spiking, especially in even low income countries. And I'm wondering what are they eating? Like, <laughs> we have people seeing food to eat in this part of the world. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, well done, well done. Really fascinating study. So, um, of course, I think most of the time when people think about Africa, we want to talk about. You know, Africa has a huge, huge burden of infectious diseases. Like we want to talk about Ebola, Lata fever, malaria. Like we are always leading the pack in malaria and a couple of other infectious diseases. And I, I think your study is really interesting because there's also this concern about some of all these metabolic diseases. So, what, where, where, where do you see your study? What role do you see your study playing in the context of the African continent? And so, what? What are the areas do you feel do you, you think that the your study will be able to you know uh, provide proper solutions maybe not immediately but perhaps in the near future uh yeah in tackling some of these conditions in Africa. Okay, yeah, very good one. 
and you know, I'm very excited that you said you had looked at this bulletin where they talked about obesity. And in fact, just give me, let me show you. Okay. I want to just show you something. Yeah. So this is from Nature Reviews, Disease Primers. It was published this year. I actually got it from my own dissertation. I want to just show you a map. I, mean, I don't know whether you would be able to see, but you know, if you look at this map right here, this is Africa. So yeah. this is the prevalence, or this is the percentage of children in Africa that are obese or overweight. So this okay. is for boys, and this is for girls. Okay. Yes. So if you look at it now, Libya. I think this is Egypt. This might be Sudan, Nigeria, South Africa both for boys and girls, have at least 20% of mm. these children. The implication is that one in five yeah. of these children are obese. So now, you know, how can this study play a role? Both from the therapeutic or drug standpoint, which we are looking at, and even from non-drug, I believe a role can be played. Things like maybe MIP3A or T-cells, I mean, it would obviously take a while for them to, should I say, have clinical use in helping maybe metabolic states or kidney disease or yeah. kidney injury in children because, like, these things will have to be tried out and it, it, they have to certify it's safe because, you know, one natural question that comes with targeting the immune system in chronic disease is, okay, well, I know I got this question once from a professor here. Some of these um, studies you do are in controlled environments where, like, at least there is you're able to minimize infection. How about the people in the real world? Mm -hmm. When you want to begin to treat them with drugs, like, okay, how do you know that they will not maybe become immunosuppressed? Because that's always a natural concern when you want to suppress the immune system. And yeah, so that is something that has to be looked at in the future. Is it about, is it a function of dose? Is it a function of duration of treatment? So like, you know, these things would come in. But the good news is, Targeting the immune system in children is not new. It is already done in type 1 diabetes. It is done in rheumatoid arthritis. Because this, so, you know, these are these are these autoimmune diseases, some of them they tend to start at a very young age. And the only way to manage them is to target the immune system. So it is already being done in children. So it shouldn't be something of great worry, at least in terms of the future. And now, one thing that I see that can be immediately applied would be aspects of insulin resistance. Because, you know, if you want to think of improving insulin resistance states, you will naturally be thinking of drugs that are already in use. I mentioned something like metformin. These things are, that drug is already being used to manage obesity in children. Okay. Even though, yeah, I think one of the, the work we are doing now is one of the first that will be looking at it from a basic science level, looking at the comp like the kidney complications of obesity, but at the clinical level, just trying to improve obesity in children, the insulin resistance and like lipid accumulation, it is already being used. So in a not too distant time, I mean, we should be able to have these conversations in Nigeria. Okay, well, the obesity situation is becoming, should I say, worrisome. Let us see what we can do, both from a drug and non-drug level. And, you know, why am I talking about drug before non-drug? It's supposed to be the other way around, and but it's still fine. You know, people would naturally say, eh, well, is it not obesity? Why not just ask the children to, I mean, like let, let them adopt lifestyle modifications and they will be fine. That is true. And that works for many. Believe me, some people remain obese despite lifestyle modifications. This is something you know, I used to, I follow the American Obesity Association and they talk about this in their life. That no matter what they do, they are still obese. So it underscores their importance for drugs for some people. So I believe it's something that will in the future have this, um, would have should I say, a good clinical application. Then generally from a non-drug level, this is one thing I have really hoped and I still hope that I would be able to get involved in either now or in the future. Just, just having these campaigns to make people realize that, oh, well, you have to, we have to really take care of our children. You know, just like you said, in the past, the problem for children in Africa would have been, oh, you're, you're malnourished, you have kwashiorkor. Then all of a sudden you're saying that you're overweight. And you, saw, you know, in part, I think this is my own hypothesis, but in part, I think we are changing as a people, you know, 
the thing is, Nigerians, I, I normally tell people here, Nigeria might be a third world country, but like not just Nigeria here might be because I'm in Nigeria, but I guess many African countries are also becoming like that. We may be third world, but we already we are already having a first world mentality because we watch these movies, we see things. So we also want to do the same things. And people have some people have the money to afford. And you know, when I worked as a pharmacist, you would see people come, they will come to the pharmacy. Six months, six months old children, they will tell you, oh, my child is not easy. And I'll be like, give this child maybe just supplements and let the child be. If children have different developmental slopes, the child will eat based on how, based on need. And they'll be like, no, okay, give me an appetite stimulant. And some of these appetite stimulants work in the brain. So from an early age, you're exposing these children to appetite stimulants. Mm -hmm. So it, it does some, it alters some, 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 some developmental programming or development in the brain. And you know, it makes them to, some of them, they become overweight very quickly. So, you know, um, what I believe is we need to have these conversations where we educate mothers, educate people to make them realize, oh, well, let these children grow at their own pace because these are some of the consequences they can face. Is it the insulin resistance? Is it the immune system activation? Is it kidney disease? And how all these things come together? So I think that these are some of the implications that research is like, mine would have now and in the future for africa yeah. yeah and yes if you yeah if you don't mind because i i like i i don't know i may have mentioned this to you during our first conversation but i think this is one stuff i just feel it's not directly related to my research but it's also in kidney disease and it's something that we should think about because it's from an evolutionary perspective for africans and i think it's very important okay so you know there is this one, what has been shown over the years is that people who are black have a higher chance of developing kidney disease due to either hypertension, due to HIV, due to, and even like, like I said, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and all that than people who are non-black. And, you know, they've been able to tie it to genetics and evolution through something called APOL1. And, you know, so, you know, why I like talking about this is because I have been privileged to meet some people who are really championing this research. And two of them I know are Nigerians and they're like doing very great stuff here. So it makes me very happy. And so, you know, the thing is this, I'm very, so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say this so you know how like just infectious diseases tie with chronic diseases in the long yeah. run. So um, I believe you're familiar with trypanosomiasis. That's like the sleeping sickness that sickness, we like yeah. to talk about. Yes, I am. Yes, and so just to make it quick, yes, the sleeping sickness. So, mm, so you know, that trypanosomiasis used to be, like they, they call it trypanosoma brucei. And so people in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, in times past got exposed to it and it was making them sick. But you know, naturally, the body likes to evolve to fight things. So, you know, along the line, this APOL1, APOL1, by the way, is part of HDL, the HDL cluster. At least you're a biochemist, you know about HDL. So it's part of that HDL cluster. And what the APOL1 does is like, it's an innate immune mechanism. It, when, as we developed this stuff, we were able to use it to damage or to cause damage to that trypanosoma parasite and kill it, like just innately. I mean, you can think about how beautiful it is. Centuries ago, millennia ago, well, there were no probably there were no drugs maybe people were chewing herbs but you know your body is able to just fight it and so it did this but you know along the line the parasite developed a change a mutation and it began to come as like what they would now call west african sleeping sickness which is they would say trypanosoma brucei gambiense or the east african sleeping sickness trypanosoma brucei rodensiense and you know what they now realized so you know the body now had to now find a way once again to fight these mutated forms. And you know, this is what happened. As that, if that APOL1 underwent this change and began, it was able to fight this trypanosoma brucei gambiense, that's the West African variant now, and was able to cause damage to it. But this was where the problem came. While causing damage to this mutated form of trypanosoma, it began to damage the kidneys as well. So, you know, just that APOL1 on his own, is capable of increasing susceptibility of Africans. Yeah, why they began to do these studies is because they realized like people of like Americans of African ancestry, that's African Americans, many of them 
the ones who are hypertensive, who develop kidney disease from the genotyping, they just realize, oh, well, they have this ApoL1 stuff. And then coming back to Africa, like the guy, the, the guy who does many of the studies here, who is a Nigerian, he told me that about 50% of Igbos are homozygous for this um, variant. I think I've seen that, um, that statement somewhere before, yeah. Yes. Yes, and I think he also said about fifty percent of Yorubas are heterozygous because you know there are different there are different genotypes of the ApoL1. So the type you have, the alleles you have together, will determine how serious your disease yeah. will be. So yeah, you know, I just wanted to say that by to tell you, okay, even beyond what I'm doing, this person is doing this. How this innate immune system can be causing damage, and you know, this is directly like in fact, this is more. This is directly important to Africa. Yeah, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, yeah, I think it's a nice background that you provided. And I think the big picture I'm getting into it, uh, I'm getting uh, the kind of big picture I'm getting for it is, you know, when uh, though there's this, you know, um, the, the fact that, you know, we need research, we need science to really get, you know, understand what's going on. Because typically what you see the media projecting is, okay, maybe don't take alcohol, don't do this, you can damage your kidneys. But people will not necessarily want to relate how they are, they have you no know, eating habits to kidney diseases. Or even imagine that maybe their ability to, you know, be resistant to one infectious disease like sleeping sickness can even contribute to their, yeah, you know, to the, to, exactly. to the disease. So yeah, science. Thanks to science. Thanks to research for you know all the answers and you no know, perspectives they are giving us. So yeah, thanks for providing that program because I think it has also provided you know this um, um better balanced perspective to your work and how important it is because um kidney when 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 we are now when I'm thinking of kidney diseases now and I think other listeners when they are thinking of kidney diseases now they are thinking of so many things they're not just thinking of you no know, this is the only thing or this is you no know, the only perspective or the only idea they have of what can mm. cause or what can you know worsen increase my risk or make me want to come down with kidney diseases. Yeah. So thank you so much for for that yes. um clarity and you know, additional information. Yeah. Okay, so uh, mm. I think we've yeah. kind of covered most of your work, and uh, so perhaps yes. if there's something else to share, you can mention later. So um, I think we just let us um, you know touch on other aspect of your experience as um, a graduate student and, of course, as a scientist. So um, regards working in the lab. So just give us an overview of what a typical day is like for you. In the lab, I, I don't know if you still do so much of lab work since you are already getting close to the end of your program. But just let us know what, um, mm. like what what goes on for you in the lab. Yeah, mm. yeah. So let's say a typical day in the lab. I would make I would I would make reference to when I used to do lots of research. You know, yeah. typically it would be like an yeah. You, you think of like an eight hour day, which okay. typically you start between eight. Yeah, it would typically start between eight and nine a.m. and would should end between four and five. PM. So, um, you know, essentially what I would do, okay, I would come in the morning, I would go look at, since I had um, a few rats to take care of every time, or most times, I would go and look at the animals and, you know, ensure that they are getting maybe their food or water supplies and every day, like, there's no problems, then, or there are no problems, then I would come back and when I come back, if I have any, any experiments to run, any assays or any experiments to run, I would get to them. Then at 12 noon, Typically, we would have lunch. So it, it all depends. Sometimes, like, the experiment you have might eat into your lunch time. <laughs> yeah, but that's fine. But most times, at 12, we are able to go for lunch. Then after lunch, at 1, come back. If the experiment needs to continue, I would continue it. Or if the experiment finishes before lunch, after lunch, I'll be trying to make sense of the data that I have generated. And yeah, that might take, like, an hour or two. Then after that, I would probably, if I have to... If I'm administering treatment to the rats, normally uh, shortly after lunch, I will go and administer the treatment to those rats and come back and continue to make sense of the data. And, you know, I guess one aspect of a PhD student's life, which is very important, is like reading material. So I, I'm always on the lookout for any publication that would be relevant to my work, to work, either to yeah. save it or read it, to read it immediately. So, yeah, that would probably take time. I mean, like that might take me an hour or two. And before you know it, you know, it's, Eight hours looks long, but before you know it, it will be 4 p.m. And sometimes as well, we would have um, lab meetings. So I think we have to factor in lab meetings. Typically, we would have lab meetings either in the morning between 10 and 11 or afternoon 
between one and two. So we basically present our data and stuff. And depending on the day, sometimes we have like every week we have um, seminars to also attend in the department or in the research center. And yeah, so it just keeps it keeps going on like that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> you had uh, maybe experiments that didn't turn out well, or the ones that turned out well. How do you um, know? How do you manage successes or failures, disappointments as a graduate student? <laughs> oh yeah, that, yeah, that's a good question because you know typically failures, successes, these things are, they are part of it. In fact, <laughs> yes. We can actually call success and failure to even be impostors because like <laughs> they would come. You have to have ways yeah. of treating them. Yeah. So okay, let me let me start with failure. So I mean, you know, I guess this is maybe the way I look at life sometimes helps me handle some of these things. It doesn't mean it doesn't pain. It pains very well. But you know, okay, so whenever I have a maybe a disappointment, I and I the first thing is and it, which is what made me pull advice, maybe. Try to find out why you know this disappointment could be a failed experiment, maybe even a failed um, grants application. Just, just look at it briefly at that time. Um, I'd like, I would just look at it briefly, and then I would drop it. Probably if I don't have any other thing to do, I could probably just go home. That time, like this, this would probably be in the afternoon anyway. I would then go home, and when I get home, rather than rather than try to read something, I may just decide to take my mind off anything related to research for that whole evening and maybe watch watch him see a movie listening to music i like music a lot listening to music or maybe just go to the gym yeah because i also like um, going to the gym i i find it a good way to distress just how, yeah exactly i distress then you know one thing i've realized is when i do that when i come back after a while to revisit that stuff i would be able to you know i'll be seeing clearer if you will and I will be able to find out, I'll be able to see reasons why that stuff did not turn out well. And okay. then at that point, I'll begin to think of what I can do to improve it. Yeah, so that's how I typically cope with failure because I just I know that it's a part of the whole process. Then for success, I mean, literally, when, when success comes, I guess we, as a lab, most times we like to, we would go out, we would probably, we would go and have lunch together in a restaurant so like that's always something good or sometimes i could yeah when the success comes i mean i could also decide to take myself out like get something nice for myself just to just to commend myself if you will for okay. the job well done mm, yeah so that's it but then you know what i always say is this is this is my own belief anyway i believe that as a person we should not dwell on failure or success for so long because you know you you have to move from your failure or success very quickly and move on to something else. Because you know, life you have to keep moving in life. That success you have today does not mean it will keep you. It won't sustain you forever. It may yeah. just sustain you for that time. So exactly, I just like I like to. I believe I should move from those things very quickly. Thank you for sharing. So I think for failure, you, you said you you like to distress, kind of just take time away from the object or whatever the failure is and just mm -hmm. you know, get involved in other things and then you come back to it so you'll be able to process it better and then um yes. success you celebrate you, know, you can, can get yourself something and you, know, you celebrate mm -hmm. it but then you try not to dwell there for too long whether it's failure or success you just stay there a bit and then you move ahead yes yeah i, I think maybe perhaps in the context of your work or maybe but generally in science or immunology because of course you started as a pharmacist but now you are you are already in the field of immunology, so you have you are, you are mm -hmm. not a stake a stakeholder. You are only one of the stakes in the African immunology. So, what are the things you think you can you know that you you would love to see happening in let's with respect to immunology research in the continent or with respect to science research generally? So, what are those things you feel like? Mm -hmm. It is something we should give attention to. This is a problem we are not we should be tackling. This is something we should be addressing. This is something we should be. You know, the conversation, these are conversations we should be have we should be having that we are not having. So let just uh, let me just get your insights on that. Hmm. Yes, um, just as you have pointed out, yeah, I think we should we are not giving in general, we are not giving sufficient attention to research or science in totality in Africa. I think only a few countries might be trying, like I know, like South Africa, for example, they have an organized system for funding, for even paying graduate students to do research and all that. But in a place like Nigeria, I don't think there is a lack 
of things like that. Maybe some private universities do give, but I don't know. But at least from my own experience, no such mm. thing is available. So yes, I think if the conversation should start from, okay, how can we have a, should I say, a very active organization, maybe an arm of the government or a foundation or even both that would be committed to providing funds for research, science-based research, I mean, I say science because immunology is also part of the whole biomedical science. Yeah, so, yeah. And yeah, so like how how we should be focused on giving money. For example, like, you know, if you look at the US, when, at times when I look at the amount of money that is allocated by the National Institute, to the National Institute of Health, like we're talking of, sometimes you hear $40 billion for a fiscal year for research. And you like, wow. Like, I mean, yes, Nigeria, we cannot get there yet as Africans. But we have a, but I mean, we cannot, we can try. Ted phone, for example, in Nigeria is still not sufficient because it seems it's targeted more at lecturers. But sometimes there are people who want to do research who are not yet in academia. So how about mm -hmm. how do we come up with a system where people who are doing research, either as PhD students, as master's students, don't have to suffer? So that, you know, because this is the thing I believe. If I am doing research with my money, it hampers a lot. I wouldn't have money all the time. I would have competing interests for that money. So yeah. it will slow my research. It makes me frustrated. I'm not able to give in my best. But then if I can go, I'm going to school with the knowledge that, oh, well, whatever research I'm, when I'm doing this research, I am being paid. So I don't even have to bother about working. The reagents in the lab, I'm not the one that will buy. I don't have to bother. Everything flows. You know, and that, all I need to do is come on, just sit down and read and do what I have to do. So, you know, at, at that point, my mind is focused on it. I'm able to come up with better ideas. Yeah. So, you know, like yeah. my thinking changes. So I think it's a, it's a conversation we really need to have. Then even just to say a little about immunology generally, you know, just like you and I have already talked about now. For the most part, back home, people still view immunology as something that should be looked at in light of infectious diseases, vaccines, or maybe recently to cancer. But nobody has thought about it in light of chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, and believe me, they do play a role. So, like, maybe our curriculum needs to be restructured to embrace these other aspects of immunology that are really emerging very fast. Yes, so that is what I think should be improved in Africa. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, basically, uh, two major things, funding to allow uh, people to do research without... You know, going to the extra burden of sourcing funds, going to work, so they can you know, can invest our brain and all of our time on research, and then exactly. Um, exactly. getting a more comprehensive curriculum, you no, know, that explores you no know, the various contributions of immunology. So not just you know focus on yes. one aspect. So kind of this balance and comprehensive um um curriculum that gives students. Uh, a better understanding of you know, how much immunology covers and all of its you know, implications. Yes. Let me put it that way. So, but I, 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 I yes. think I should just chip this in. Um, so, yes, do, you see, do you see yourself playing a role in you know, some, these, some of these areas in the near future? So, like, I know you're in the US now, and I just thought I should ask, like, maybe do you see yourself maybe coming back to the African continent in the near future to you know, see how you can... You know, um, effect or implement some of these suggestions you are you have in mind yes i mean you know home will always be home no matter where you are so you know like that's interest i think that is something that we really need to even if i'm happy you brought it's a very good thing it's something we should have that conversation with people yes i honestly am interested in having an impact on the african continent nigeria and africa in general either directly or indirectly, I would really want to be involved to improve the situation. At least let's let's make it better than what it is. Yes, I am interested in doing that. Great, great. Yes. So uh, we'll be looking forward to it. So for someone who, who wants to know, who wants to know who won a peripe beyond his research for, you know, beyond what you do in the lab, beyond you as a pharmacist and pharmacist and immunologist now. So what what, what are those um, um, words that come to mind if you want to describe yourself? What are some of the principles you know, that have shaped your life until now and that you feel like hey, these are the things, these are the values, these are my values, these are the principles that guide my life. And these are like, if you want to know me outside of every other thing, this is who Ubong is. So tell us those, mm. those things. 
Okay. Well, I would say purpose. Okay. Passion and diligence. Mm. Um. Okay. Yeah, because you know, as a person, I you know, I've always been this kind of person. I, I, I always have this mental picture of what I want what I want to do, what I want to be. Like, it doesn't matter whether it's, like, science-related. In any endeavor I delve into, like, just, like, yeah, just knowing what I want. And, you know, I believe that having that purpose always helps me to develop the passion. So, like, the purpose drives my passion. And, you know, so that's passion now, you know. So when I get passionate about something, it all, it gives me what I would call a mental strength. The purpose gives a mental picture. The passion gives a mental strength. And you know, now where is this mental strength very important? It leads to the next thing, diligence. You know, I believe that you you have to put in the work. You have to put in the work. Yeah, you know, we because we find ourselves in the world where people, people at times are they always want to they, they want to see how they can achieve something without probably putting in the work. And you know, at times that doesn't help. Because you know you don't go through the process to appreciate it. But then I'm not saying that you should you shouldn't kill yourself when working. Like you should work smart. You should work yeah. smart. Know where to channel that energy. It should be where you're going to get that thing that you want. So yes, and you know why do I think this is important? You know there is something about diligence and hard work or putting in the work. At times you would get tired. Your body would get tired naturally. That physical body would always get tired. So I think that is where that mental strength from passion will keep pushing you because there are times you may be very tired and you know you have to get the work done so what do you do you know it's just that driving your brain okay we'll just keep pushing the body so yeah that's how i always that's how i always look at it and it has helped and even yeah there are times even the mental strength will want to win so i mean you would, at that point you want to rest to recharge your battery then you continue yeah so that is i guess generally this is how that is how i look at life and um, purpose Passion. Passion. Um, yes. You have uh, motivated us today. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, purpose gives mental picture. Um, so, from there, you get your passion. Passion gives mental strength, and then you become diligent. I think that's that's mm -hmm. like an, an amazing perspective. Like, I, I love the progression. I love okay. the connection. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so, thank you. So, uh, you you mentioned your profile. I think it was really interesting. I I I don't know. I think I was not um I was not surprised to see it, but like I think it was like oh perfect because that's why I I quickly asked. Oh, you're from Aquaibom, and you were like okay, yes, Aquaibom. So you said you've been cooking since you were mm -hmm. nine, and um yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think for a guy in Nigeria, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it deserves, it deserves an applause. So, um, so let me ask, pitch the question this way. So do you still have time to cook and explore different flavors and recipes in God's school? Absolutely. In fact, you know, I actually forgot to mention one of the things I used to distress is cooking. Is oh, cooking. Oh, so that's like, good. Yes. Yes, cooking is a hobby. I will tell you the truth. Like, you know, I love cooking. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I I still cook. Like, it's, in fact, sometimes even on my busiest days, I would, I could rather, I can decide to wake up two hours early or two hours earlier to cook my food that I would take to school. Yeah, I love cooking. I still, I still cook. Yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think we'll take our phone question now. So, a random question to just uh, uh, to wrap up the the conversation. So um, yes. So I, I think the question I would love to ask is, um, what's one piece of advice? So you've uh, you've you know, journeyed through life for a couple of years now, and of course, research wise, outside research, you you've experienced life, and you know, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, I think there are times you you would think back and you know, think of your younger self and say, okay, this was how Bong was when he was younger, and you know, these were some of his dreams, passions, and all of that. So, what was one advice you think if you 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 saw your younger self today that you would give to your younger self, and of course that you can. I think um one I think um and I forgot where I got the quote from, but someone said that all advice I think is Austin Cleon that all advice or 
for me, I think it's most advice. Maybe not all, but he said all advice are autobiog <laughs> autobiographical. That maybe when you are when you are advising someone younger, it's actually like you're advising your younger self. Maybe you no, know, yeah, mm -hmm. telling telling someone what you what you 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 could have done if you are in their shoes at that um stage of their mm -hmm. life. So, what advice do you think you can give you would give to your younger self? You no, know, looking back today. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, so one advice I would give to my younger self is, which I would now be giving to, you know, don't be so hard on yourself. Okay. It's, um you know, yeah, because, you know, sometimes like people who get very passionate about things, and I know there are many of us out there like that, like we are very crazy about what we want to be. We want to, we don't mind. We just want to put it in. We want to keep, we want to keep going at it, which is a good thing. But, you know, don't be so hard on yourself because, Believe it or not, there are times you will fail. There are times you may not even fail. There are times you would your growth will just be stunted. And, you know, it may just be something that you cannot control. It may just be maybe a circumstance that you just have to allow to pass. So, you know, what, what I have learned over the years is, you know, when things like that happen, rather than dwell on it and feel very miserable, like try to find the silver lining in it. Try to find something or an alternative stuff that can take that time that will still be developing you in another aspect while waiting for that primary thing that you want so the whole graduate journey when i finished school i was looking for opportunities abroad i couldn't get these opportunities early like i mean at times you will get you will get the admission you wouldn't have the funding, no funding yeah. or you they will not even respond <laughs> to you and so yeah. you know i decided to do a master's in pharmacology at uni ben and you know it, I found okay, like despite the effort I was putting in, like this guy, I would, I worked so hard, I worked so hard, like you know, I probably was not even working smart at the time. I was just working hard. I wanted to get it done, and you know, then boom, at a point like I had, I literally had to resign from my job. Believe me, just because I wanted to do my bench work in the lab. And, you know, believe me, after the bench work, I was broke. Like, I was down to zero because I, I was literally funding my research. And luckily, I got a job once again anyway, shortly after. But at a point, when I was hoping that I would graduate, this was sometime around 2018, the administrative yeah. process at the point to send out my dissertation or my master's was, was very slow and actually went on strike. And I became so sad. Like, because at that point, I was waiting. Like, oh, well, I probably want to get this master's and apply for a PhD. But I also went on strike. And at a point, I was just so like, oh, man, I don't think I can really just keep waiting. Let me think of other things. It was in the process I got a grant to go to South Africa to do research while they strike. It was in that same process while waiting. I now realized, oh, well, I could just use my bachelor's degree to apply for a PhD straight up. And I was like, oh, well, I'm willing to try. And somehow, like, you know, it was, it happened. So I was so excited. It so happened that I was my phd admission my master's defense everything came out they came about they, they took place at about the same time just in fact within the space of one week so you see if i kept dwelling on the fact that oh well i am oh i'm so miserable i'm like this stuff is not working i probably wouldn't have taken that step to do the whole so like yeah. generally don't be hard on yourself always think of there are many ways to get to a place always think of the alternatives every time like just know that okay, well, even the fact that one way is blocked now doesn't mean it will not reopen. The fact that this way is blocked doesn't mean I cannot use an alternate way to do it. Yeah, so Jen, that, that, I know I've said it a lot, but yeah, in summary, don't be hard on yourself. Look for alternate ways to do things. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank thank you for sharing. I think I love the fact that you shared. You, you know, infuse your personal story into it. So we should mm -hmm. always look out for the silver lining in our dark cloud. We should not be hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we should know explore yeah. alternative routes, right? So you know, yes. we should not just be fixated on this is this is you no, know, of course you can be fixated on where you want to get to, but don't be fixated on you no know, a fix I have a fixed, you no, know, this is the route I must follow, or this is where I must right. route I must take together. Yeah. So right. I think, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So those are that, that's that's a great advice. Uh, that, that's a great advice, I would say, coupled with the you know the other um um principles you shared about purpose, passion, and diligence. I think we we uh, we have we've been overfed. I think your your session will be some of the listeners obese. <laughs> oh well, I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah. The immune system takes center stage in the onset 
progression and management of several diseases. And it's interesting to see how kidney diseases fit into the long list through Ubong's research. With the surging incidence rate of obesity across Africa and the world, particularly in young people, we've been forced to grapple with a monstrous problem. However, we are not completely helpless. As scientists turn to the field of immunology for answers, it is important that we all embrace health-promoting dietary habits and lifestyles. Thank you for listening to this episode on Immuno Africa. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to share it with your network. You will learn first about future episodes and get other immunology related updates by following Immuno underscore Africa or the Immunology in Africa podcast on social media. See you on the next episode. Bye.